Good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started in about four minutes. Um, we'll let some more people in, get everyone adjusted to move in from session to session. We're going to get started here in about one minute. It looks like we still have people um, joining us, so we'll, we'll get ready here in about one minute. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Stephanie Hospelhorn. I um, have seen many of you guys here uh, in the last teacher sessions throughout the thing, but um, for those of you, if you're new joining us today, um, I'm the education specialist here at Illinois Ag in the Classroom. Um, today I'm going to be talking to you about critter culture. So going along the theme of looking at the culture of agriculture um, and I kind of wanted to focus on the animals, especially because um, we as, as adults, as kids, we're so used to the, the foods and the animals, the livestock, the, the animals that are in agriculture, and we just kind of forget that there's all of these other different types of animals that are used throughout the world and in different cultures um, that are different than what we're used to seeing here. Um, and who doesn't like animals? So this is going to be, hopefully, um, you'll find some really fun lessons and, and some books and stuff. I do want to let you know, um, I'm sitting outside. It's super humid, so you might see my hair just get bigger and bigger as we go on. So that's just a little bit of a warning. Um, it's super humid out, but I love being outside and it's a beautiful rainy day. So um, critter culture, the diversity of animal ag around the world. Um, 
we're going to go hot. I have it sectioned off into a diff, um, some different categories. And so I'm going to focus on this first section is going to be on dairy and a couple of the different um, countries that uh, use different animals for dairy, where we primarily get our uh, dairy products from our cows. Um, there are other countries that rely on different sorts of animals or just have some fun different animals that we don't usually look at. So a lot like here in the United States, we do have goats for milking. Um, in Africa, this is a larger part of um, why they raise goats is for the milk. Um, and so you can see here, there's a little picture. Um, this is a, a smaller goat uh, dairy farm um, and you can see the the milking uh, machinery is very similar to what we might see here in the United States. So that could be something that you talk to um, with your students is comparing the different animals, comparing uh, the machinery that's used um, to get the milk um, to be pr um, processed for our different dairy products. Um, another thing, another activity that you could do is look at uh, ruminants. Um, so our ruminant animals. And so I have a picture right down here of the uh, digestive system of a goat, which is the same as a cow. So those ruminant uh, animals. And so this picture just kind of shows like the flow of the food that would go through uh, that ruminant digestive system and then out. So um, especially uh, middle school and high school level, you guys can definitely get into more of like the, uh, the biology of that. Um, I did put on this little sign, the Everyday Ag. If you check out our Everyday Ag um, lessons for uh, that we were putting out um, in March, April, May, if you check out the Everyday Ag from our beyondthebarndoor.wordpress.com blog, um, the West Virginia uh, state, when we did the Scrambled States, um, it has a lot of, we did uh, activities on hay and the difference between hay and straw, um, the nutritional value. We had a STEM activity where the kids had to create, um, design their own, um, you know, storage uh, area for the hay and what that would look like. Um, so th that's another uh, area that you could check out to get more hay activities if you're looking more into, you know, what do our goats eat? What do we feed our cows? What do we feed our livestock that is producing this dairy? Um, the, the little book that I have up here is called Beatrice's Goat. And this is about a little girl in Africa, um, in Uganda, who is really wanting to be a school girl and her family just doesn't have the money. Um, and so, um, her family was uh, provided a goat through the Heifer Project International, which is um, an actual international organization that donates livestock to poor communities. Um, and so, she, and so her family has donated this goat and through that she's able to milk it and uh, sell the milk so that she can afford um, to go to school. So it's a really fun, uh, cute little book um, that you can tie in with Africa and with the dairy goats. Um, another dairy animal is a camel, which might be surprising to many students and maybe even many adults, um, but we're focusing on uh, the aspect from Australia. So we're going down under for this one. And we're looking at uh, the fact that we have uh, camel farms where they they uh, milk the camels and can use the milk from camels to make many different milk products um, or dairy products, I'm sorry. So up here in the right hand corner, I have a little, um, a little chart, it shows the nutritional values of camel milk. So one activity you could do with your students um, is to compare the nutritional value of milk from a camel versus milk from a cow versus the milk from, you know, a goat. And so you can look at the differences, you know, how much protein is in there, the carbs, the fats, all of that kind of stuff. So that um, could be an activity that you do there. Um, you could definitely read a couple of these little books. This one is a camel, a mammal. Um, it's a Dr. Seuss book by Trish Ram. And basically it's looking at just mammals. Uh, for your younger kiddos, um, what is a mammal? What um, are the characteristics of a camel versus other things? And tying that in with um, dairy. And then the camel who crossed Australia um, this is a historical fiction book and it would be appropriate for junior high or older. Um, and it looks into the um, Australian explorers, uh, Robert O'Hara, Burke and William John um, Wills and their um, exploration of, of 
trekking across Australia from the northern part of Australia down to the southern part of Australia. Um, and uh, a lot of the book is through the perspective of the camel who is named uh, Belle Singh. Um, and so it just takes us on this journey. It's historical fiction. Um, and these are, uh, Burke and Wolves are, are the actual expedi expedition um, explorers. And it's from 1860 to 1861. So junior high, high school, if you're looking into the history, if you're looking into, you can make those connections with westward expansion. It was around the same time, looking at explorers in other countries and, and the feats that they um, accomplished. So those are some different, some different animals for dairy. If you want to do some different dairy activities, um, we have our Dairy Ag Mag. Um, this is a screenshot from our online version. Um, and so if you notice, there's a little green leaf right here and up in the top right hand corner. If you go to the online version through our website, which I'm going to show at the very end um, of my presentation on um, how you can get to there. Um, the little leaves, if you click on them, um, it's an interactive uh, website. So it'll take you to uh, second, primary and secondary sources that go along with the section that's there. So you can um, do a web quest. You can have them just search, use that for yourself um, to show the videos, um, use the Dairy Ag Mag um, in your classroom. Um, and then we have two dairy uh, activities, our Better Butter and Ice Cream in a Bag, which is appropriate for um, elementary, junior high and above. It's fun to do um, and you can definitely do that in with your classroom. Um, the Better Butter and the Ice Cream in a Bag, these two will be posted on the blog site um, later this afternoon when this uh, video is also shared as well. Moving on, um, we're looking at fiber. So the fiber that we get from um, animals to make our clothing. Um, a lot of students don't make that connection that our clothes um, are made from either plant or animal fibers. Um, and so it's kind of a cool thing to look into. You can definitely put an art uh, aspect into um, your teaching. So for the, our first stop is going to be down in South America, where we're looking at alpaca farms uh, for their fiber. A couple of books that I, um, I have here, we have Llama or Alpaca. So it's just a, a fun um, fiction or non-fictional book about uh, looking at the differences, they look very similar. What are the differences? What do they look like? Their structural features, um, their locations, things like that. And then we have another little book. This is great for elementary, um, Alpaca Patty's Fancy Fleece. And it takes us through um, little Patty. She loves her fleece. It's so soft. It's so, you know, beautiful. And when she learns that she's getting sheared, she gets really, really upset because her fleece is so beautiful. But when she learns that, the reason she's getting sheared is because it's um, going to produce clothing and blankets for people to stay warm. She feels like it's a really good thing um, that she can share her fleece um, to help others. So it's a really cute book. An activity to go along with this, um, oops, I clicked the wrong button, uh, is this little basket weaving to look at how um, how blankets, how clothing, how baskets, how everything is weaved. And so this is just using paper strips. Um, the paper strips are colored differently. Um, if you check out the um, fiber everyday ag, again on our blog and you go to um, our everyday ag tab and then scroll down to where we, um, we focused on fiber. Um, there's a lot more activities that you could do. Um, I know Kevin had talked about the cotton uh, um, activity in his presentation last hour, where you can you can get cotton and you can um, you know make bracelets, you can weave it, anything like that. So you can make the connections of okay, so we have these animals that we're raising, we can cheer them. What other animals do we use for this? Um, we have sheep, we have goats. Where in the world would we find these animals? Where are they raised? Where are they raised here in the United States? What different breeds do, um, do we look at for their different types of uh, uh, hair and fiber? And then also you can make that transition into looking at plants. What type of plants also? We have cotton, we have bamboo, we have all sorts of different things that we use for different types of products. Um, this is a screenshot down in the bo bottom right hand corner is a screenshot from a video um, from an alpaca farm here in Illinois, in Prophetstown, Illinois. Um, and so one of our county coordinators, uh, this is a, a virtual tour of this farm. And so it's really fun. Our virtual, our, our coordinators have posted this 
Um, and so this also will be in the link on our blog um, so that you can share. It's a virtual tour of this alpaca farm um, right here in Illinois. And so, you know, students might not even know that we are raising, you know, um, alpaca here in Illinois. They're not, uh, you know, native to this area. So it's a, it might be something fun to share with them. Moving on, we have uh, silkworms in China. So looking at the use of, of, of insects. So we have um, over here on the left-hand side, the empress and the silkworm. So this is looking at ancient history in 2700 BC. It's a legend of um, where, uh, where the discovery of silk and how we could use silkworms to produce, you know, clothing um, and whatnot. Um, you could also, for uh, junior high, high school level, um, you could tie this into the ancient history and looking at the Silk Road and trade and all of that. Um, so kind of differentiating into that higher age group. Um, Stella, the silkworm, would tie in perfectly if you want to raise silkworms in your classroom. Um, there are uh, kits that you can buy. Um, from educational sites, um, and there's a lot of different blogs from teachers who have raised silkworms in their classroom, and so you can definitely do that. Stella the Silkworm is a great book for that because it, it's from the, the silkworm, Stella, it's from her perspective, and it takes you through the environment that she needs to um, live, what she, the, the nutrition that she needs to, you know, um, survive and, and, and be healthy, and it just takes you through the entire um, uh, raising silkworms and what they need. I have a little map over here of a silkworm life cycle. Again, something that you could you could look into with your students, um, especially in elementary school when you're looking at, at cycles um, with all sorts of insects, with animals in general, you can definitely make that connection. And then up here is just um, a, a picture, a historical photo um, that you could use in junior high, probably even high school for primary, secondary sources. You know, looking at pictures, trying to identify what's happening um, and really uh, observing those, making inferences, talking it out. It could be a part of a gallery walk if you um, chose to do something like that. Um, but um, I definitely, when I was teaching sixth grade, we did gallery walks a lot. My students loved it and we did something Thing called um, Think, Wonder, Share, where they had to look at a photo um, for one minute and write down anything, any questions that they might have of it, and then they would wonder, you know, well, how can I answer that question? They're, they're writing, you know, anything that they're observing, and then they're writing down questions, and then they're sharing and communicating and trying to answer their questions just based off of, in, you know, the inferences from um, that photo. So that's definitely another activity that you could do with, um, you know, any of these. Some additional activities that you could do with fibers. Um, you know, what other animal and plants are used for fiber, which I mentioned. You could definitely make bracelets, um, you know, practice braiding and not tying, looking into the materials. Well, where did this yarn come from? Where did this string come from? And then doing a practical skill like braiding and tying knots. You could definitely add into there. Um, you could compare the fabric tags on your clothes. So, you know, have them look at their tags. What, what is the shirt that you're wearing right now? What is it, is it made out of? Um, cotton? Is it polyester? Is it, you know, silk? Is it anything? And then have them look into, well, where did that come from? How was it processed? They do have several episodes on the TV show, How It's Made, um, looking at, uh, you know, textiles and, and clothing and, and things like that. You could uh, then look at different textiles and dyes. What does that look like? What in the fashion industry, what are we doing? Where do they get their dye from? Are there natural dyes that we could use? Are there natural agricultural dyes? Um, what about beet juice? And if you, um, you know, uh, puree carrots, is that gonna, you know, dye the, the um, fabric orange? How well is it gonna stay, you know, when you wash it, things like that. Um, and then you could definitely compare the different textures um, of different fibers. What do they look like? Make those observations. Um, what, which one is softer? Which one is um, more maybe um, fibrous? You know, making those comparisons and then looking at the differences. Uh, did you get this from a cashmere goat versus, you know, the different species of goats? Did you, um, is this silk? Is it polyester? Is it more of a, a synthetic type of fabric? Um, any of that kind of stuff. Then up here, 
Um, I have the uh, our Terra Nova. So we have Terra Nova and readers, which again, I'm going to show you where to find that on our website at the very end of my presentation. So we have this one that's focused on specialty animals. Um, and so they do have ostrich and quail and, and apaca and all that kind of stuff in there. Um, and so that would definitely be a great resource to use. Um, for talking about fiber. And then again, our everyday ag fiber activities that can be found on our blog. All right, our pollinators. I have one country for pollinators. Now, obviously pollinators are found on every country throughout the entire world, um, especially bees. It, we always hear about bees. We have so many different resources on bees um, and there are many different types of bees in these different countries that are really important. There's a lot of different uh, organizations who are um, aware that bee populations are decreasing and they want to figure out why and they understand the importance of, of bee populations. So you could definitely do a lot with bee populations. I chose to focus on um, Mexico with the monarch migration. Um, because it's such a cool, cool thing. And if anybody ever has a chance to get out or if you've ever seen the uh, monarch migration, it's such a cool thing. Um, and so this would be a really cool thing, especially if you're teaching, um, you know, uh, migratorial patterns in, um, if you're doing life science in uh, junior high or high school, this would be a really cool thing. Um, but I, I included a couple books here. So Senorita um, Mariposa. So this is a really cool book. It's written, um, it's sort of, it's, it's a poem and um, Mr. G is what he likes to go by. So Ben, the author, he um, incorporates bilingual um, aspects throughout all of his poetry through this, um, this book. Um, it's really cool because our, our Senorita Mariposa, our butterfly, she uh, takes us through migrating from the United States down to um, Mexico and and tells us her story of who she's met along the way, different animals, different people, the, the scenery, the, um, the different environments and landscapes. And so it's a pretty um, fun way to learn about uh, their route, what they see, different, um, different people and different animals in just a fun way. It's also very informational um, about the monarch butterfly. And then Uncle Monarch and the Day of the Dead. Um, this is a, a children's book that focuses on um, the fact that uh, the monarch migration and when they arrive down in Mexico coincides with um, the, the week celebration of Dia de los Muertos in Mexico. And so ha it really is a great children's book to help students um, kind of have a different aspect on how other cultures, uh, you know, um, celebrate um, the death of, of their, you know, loved ones. And then it coincides with the butterfly mar um, migration. And so there's a lot of really cool stuff in there um, to connect the two. At the end of this book, there's also um, different terminology from uh, any of the, the Spanish words that are used in there. Um, it, it, there's a list of terms and the definition. There's a really awesome explanation of what Dia de los Muertos is. Um, so you can definitely talk to your kiddos about that. This picture up here on the right hand side is a fun pollination activity. Um, there's a bee cutout right here. However, you could do just simple butterfly cutouts and um, that it, it goes around the student's hand. And so you have little brown paper bags set up and on the inside are Cheetos. And so Cheetos have that really powdery outside. So when you get done eating even one, you have that powder on your fingers. And so that kind of represents the pollen. And so as, as kids are reaching into the bag, they get their Cheetos, they have it all over. And then they, um, when they decide to go to a different flower, they touch the flower on the front side of that bag and they'll see that the pollen or the Cheeto dust is um, from their fingers gets uh, transferred onto the flower. And so that's another way that you could represent um, pollination and how that happens. Um, and so I will post uh, the activity, that activity on the blog later this afternoon as well. Here's some more uh, pollination activities for you. So our pollinator ag mag, again, this one is um, a, just a screenshot from our online uh, 
um, website. And so right here, you can see there's a little video camera. That means that it's a, it's a video link that you could click on. So our, again, our primary and secondary sources. Um, here is our bag butterfly, which I had mentioned a couple weeks ago when I was doing my Apple presentation. Um, you can use any sort of uh, confetti or we use tissue paper and you can use whatever colors in there. Um, this one has black and orange and white um, because it's connecting to that um, the monarch migration, um, but you can use several other colors and make it different sorts of activities. This is um, the butterfly life cycle. So again, you can um, connect that with our silkworm activity. And this one uses pasta. So different types of pasta represent the different um, stages of the life. Um, you don't have to get this detailed if you want. Um, if, you're use, if you're with really young kiddos, you can just glue the pasta straight on there. You could have it on a sheet of paper where you just print and it already has all of the you know, stages labeled and uh, you know, pictures of leaves and whatnot. So they just have to glue the pasta right on there. Um, it depends on what age group you're teaching and, and um, you know, how much hands-on work you wanna do. Um, our throw and grow activity is a really great activity. So it's taking, um, you use a little bit of uh, molding clay and then, or modeling clay, and then you uh, push um, it into native flower seeds for your area. And then you um, put it in soil and clump it, and then you can just throw it and then it will start growing once it takes into the ground. So that's a really fun one to, um, you know, increase pollinators. Um, in your area. You might even, if your school has an area where you could do, um, you know, a school pollination garden or somewhere in your community um, where, you know, if you want to take on something like that, that would be a really cool thing. A STEM activity could be where they're just designing uh, the pollinator garden in your in your um, area, maybe uh, maybe you're trying to persuade your school and your principal to let you build um, a pollinator garden. So the STEM activity is definitely the engineering, the architecture, measuring everything out, organizing what type of um, uh, you know plants that you want in there, the the type of uh, plants in that area that would attract pollinators, and then if you want to tie it into ELA, you could have them write a persuasive paper with that. Um, with this is the, um, this Journey North is a cool website where you can track the different uh, migrations and different seasons. But also if you go to that website and um, search their symbolic migration, there's a really cool international, um, it's very similar to being like a pen pal, but you're not writing letters, but you're sending a paper monarch butterfly down. Um, as the, the monarchs are reaching Mexico during their migration, you would send the letter so that a school in Mexico would get their monarchs. And then when the butterflies come back, back to the United States, then the schools in Mexico send their little paper monarch butterflies back up here. And so it's kind of like a little pen pal, but it's, it's um, you know, showing that, that international connection between students. So it's a, it's a pretty fun thing. The last category is our animal aid. So we have a lot of animals that we don't just raise for their fiber or their dairy. Um, or even their meat that we eat, um, we also have animals that help us. So in Greenland, um, we have a lot of different communities that are um, very rural and there are no roads or anything that lead um, to their little communities. And so they rely on sled dogs um, to get to the larger cities to, you know, pick up packages, any sort of, um, anything that they need. Um, and so they go across that um, the snowy terrain and they use um, sled dogs to do that. So there are three books that I've included um, for each age group. So The True Tales of Togo the Sled Dog takes a look into the very famous story that we all know about Balto, um, but we often forget about Togo. He, his story is not um, usually represented. And so this is a story for focus for elementary, but it's appropriate for junior high as well. Um, the Travels with Gannon and Wyatt, um, that's a whole set, but they have one book specifically focused on Greenland. Um, now we're looking at adventure um, 
And uh, this is definitely middle level adventure. They're looking at the rough terrain. There's a family that's stranded that needs help. And so um, our characters have to go across the terrain uh, to try and save them. And so of course they're being led on a sled by the sled dogs. And so it talks about all sorts of different things and, and how to survive in um, such a, an extreme terrain like Greenland has in many of its areas. And then the high school level, this cold heaven, this would be high school um, or even an adult. Um, novel again it's adventure um and it's looking into the inuit um lifestyle surviving that harsh terrain looking at the communities who um who still live very out in the distance and and not around um you know our our urban areas so those are some different things i have a stem activity right down here um you could have them make a little sled give them certain materials, they have to design it, and whichever one can move from point A to point B without losing any of its, um, its produce. In this picture, it's just little puff balls. Um, you could start looking into uh, force and movement and, and start adding some incline in there, different terrain, you know, a smooth desk versus a carpet, um, you know, things like that. Our other animal aids is um, we're looking at India where the use of uh, donkeys and mules come in handy when they're trying to move stuff to the marketplace or uh, bringing stuff home from the marketplace um, or moving anything. You could look into the difference between a donkey and a horse and a mule and look at the, the similarities and differences. You could look at the fact that we use mules for a lot of different things all around the world, um, especially one popular thing is here in the United States when we're looking at uh, touring the Grand Canyon. Um, if you ever go on, on a tour over there, you're riding a mule all throughout. They don't spook easily. They're, you know, they're, um, they have a solid footing on the ground. Um, and so they're, they're considered our beasts of burden. Um, and so you could definitely look into the history of that. I have a little story right here, Goodnight India, um, which focuses on our two um, uh, children who live in India and they're talking about all of the beautiful things, the cultural things in India um, as they're saying, you know, goodnight and they're focusing on, you know, the Himalayan mountains and, and all of the, the different temples and everything over there. So it's a tie into um, their culture. There are some different aspects with that as well. I'm going to skip the screen real quick that you can um, look at animal domestication. So tying into the fact that we have animals that we use for help, where did that even get started? So looking into the history, you can look at um, the, the cave drawings. Um, you can look into um, ancient uh, uh, harnesses and, and um, ancient uh, farm equipment like these horses pulling, you know, how, how did farmers used to, you know, till their farms and do all that without having, you know, tractors and combines and all that? What did they used to do? So you could definitely look into the history of animal domestication. Um, that would be a cool uh, connection. With this one, this is just, I have just a couple more minutes and then I'll be done. Um, just some other fun foods. So if you wanted to focus on actual like foods instead of, you know, other things that I've been talking about in Russia, caviar is a huge thing. Um, so you could look into what is caviar and, and all of that. Uh, Japan, we have um, a huge part of their culture is to eat octopus. Uh, Ukraine, we have um, ostrich farms where they raise ostrich for um, their eggs. And in this picture, it's comparing an ostrich egg to our chicken eggs. They also raise ostrich for meat. And then in Spain, escargot, our fun little slimy snails are a huge and popular dish there. So just some fun um, cultural foods around the world now. Another thing is you could talk about how they, they are here as well. You know, we do have ostrich farms here in the United States. Um, we do have um, caviar here. So why do we have those things? You could definitely tie that into immigration and, and cultural things and just um, imports and exports and, and all of that fun stuff. All right, I'm going to take a look at our questions and see if we have any. Um, so it looks like no questions, but Chris uh, has shared a video um, that he made earlier this year for the grow or throw and grow activity. If you want to check that out to to kind of get a good idea of what I was talking about. Um, we have about 20 minutes left. 
Um, our intern uh, for the Ag Engagement, she's been uh, working with Gracie, her name is Taylor. She has about 15 minute presentation to kind of share what she has been working on um, during her internship. I just need to find her and make her co-host. Let's see. How do I make you a co-host? So first I, let's see, where is your name at? Hold on a second, I'm not very good at this. Everyone bear with me. There you are, co-host. All right, Taylor, um, I think you can unmute yourself. You are a co-host. So Taylor is going to introduce herself and kind of talk about what she's been working on um, with the projects and what she's done. Um, then I'll answer any other questions and then we will be done with the session. All you, Taylor. Thank you. Um, so hello, my name is Taylor Hartke. I am from Teutopolis, Illinois, which is in Effingham County and will be a junior at SAUC studying agriculture communications. And this summer I've had the privilege of being the consumer engagement intern and for at least another week. And um, with consumer engagement, uh, we focus on providing materials to counties and creating those materials so that they can connect with um, the next level. So starting at about college age and above and start hitting some of that age demographics and connecting them to agriculture in a different way. So I do come from a family farm as well. We have corn, soybeans, wheat, uh, steers, as well as swine. So I have a little bit of background. And one of the things that I've been working on is our combine graphics. So taking a huge machine that everyone sees in the fields to kind of simplify it and break it down exactly how that works. So I'll go ahead and throw that on the screen now. I will also be forewarning you, my internet has been terrible this morning and it's also been raining nonstop, so it could get really dark. <laughs> Let's see if this works. Can everybody see my screen? It looks like, yep, yep, we sure can. Awesome. So here is uh, the graphic that we've been working on and if you're a fan of green tractors, we also have a version that is green. Um, but it's how a combine works. So during the harvest season, of course, we see them. And um, a big part of a combine is that it revolutionized how to harvest. It took the three steps um, of reaping, threshing, and winnowing and put them all together in one large machine. And as you can see, um, this is harvesting corn. So it's a corn head um, right here. That's what cuts the plant at the base and pulls it into the combine. The spinning augers continue to move that towards the center. And as we move back, there's also the threshing drum that is breaking the grain away from the plant. So separating the grain from everything else, the grain moves its way all the way up to the grain tank where it is separated. It should just be grain, whereas the rest of it is moved towards the back of the machine that goes through the straw chopper, which chops it into little pieces and helps the farmer spread it across their field um, for next season or whatever is going to be there next. And then the auger is what goes and opens, allows the farmer to unload that grain from the grain tank and put it into the awaiting grain cart or truck that is ready to go to go to their farm or the elevator, whatever it might be. So that's super fast um, way to explain it but there is a video that I will be showing that will go more in depth and will give you some more information. Hi, I'm Jack McCormick, a farmer from Randolph County, Illinois. I'd like to tell you how Taylor, it doesn't look like your video is sharing. Okay. <laughs> I think you have to exit out of the one you're sharing and then reshare the video screen. <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> is it sharing now? Um, it's, yep, sure is. Okay, let me know if there's no audio, if there's any other issues. Thank sure. you. All good. Great. Hi, 
I'm Jack McCormick, a farmer from Randolph County, Illinois. I'd like to tell you how a combine works. You see these great big things in the fields and on the roads, and I'll kind of tell you how, how they work. First up front, this is the combine header. And all this does is cut and gather the crop. It doesn't do any separating of any kind. Uh, these headers come in. Oh, no. <laughs> of course. In different styles for different crops. Uh, they come in different sizes, anywhere from 15 feet all the way up to 45 feet, uh, depending on the farmer's needs and how. <laughs> it's just going to be one of those days. Yep. Taylor, if it, do, if it doesn't, um, you know, work, we could definitely post this video to the blog um, later this afternoon, okay? Sounds good. <laughs> See if that works, and then we'll say. The internal, the guts of the combine, sort of. Uh, there's a, a large rotor in here that takes the grain still attached to the straw and takes it around so you get momentum going Ooh. and gravity and it starts to separate the heavy from We can post the link. <laughs> okay, yeah, so we're gonna have to post that later. Sorry. And then the grain simply falls through these grates. Okay. And so that explains, there's quite a bit more to that video, but it explains what's going on um, with that combine, goes in depth on those different pieces that are highlighted in the um, graphic. I do have another video which should work because it's just on my computer, and it goes in depth more on what's going on the inside of the combine. So this is actually my father explaining exactly what he's looking at and uh, explaining what's going kind of through his mind when he's harvesting. And it actually has a bean or a wheat head on it. And it'll go through him also putting it on. And I apologize, he didn't really look at the camera, but we're working with what we got. <laughs> is it sharing? Um, yep, it sure is. The combine cab here, we'll start with uh, first thing you normally do is turn this GPS receiver yield monitor on. This not only does it, uh, it keep track of the field, the farm, the field, uh, we're at in the field. It also makes a map and it shows the field here. Okay, that's the field of wheat we just got done doing here last month. Uh, as you go down through the field and as it's combining, Gathering the, gathering the wheat in, it'll go ahead and set having an average here. It'll have what that field is yielding at that second in time. It'll tell you what moisture it is in that area of the field, wetter spots of the field have a higher moisture. What that does at the end of the day, you can look at your average of a 19.7 moisture. When I go back to the drying bin to see how wet the, uh, the wheat was, I know where we started at. And as we test that the next week or two, we know how we're doing on drying and making sure it's not getting hot. Uh, also tells the area that we've got done, uh, wet weight, and also dry bushels on the uh, on the monitor here. Okay, up in this corner here, I can select what crop we're going into, wheat, dry, barley. I'm going to let that back at wheat where it was at. Uh, this here is the cylinder. That is what does the threshing of the wheat out of the head. I can control the clearance, which is how far down it's squeezed to make sure we get that grain out of the head, but also the speed from right here in the cab. And it will tell me what it is running speed-wise right here. And it will tell me on the width, it'll come up on this screen here when I squeeze that down. Okay, on the fan, same thing. You got, uh, when you shell the wheat out, or the corner beans, the wheat will have poles. 
And what the fan does, it blows those holes out. So that way, when it goes to the miller, they have less foreign material to clean out before they start making flour. Okay, so we can go ahead and we can change the fan speed as we go through the field. If we see the grain tank's dirty, it's got too much of it in there, we can slow the fan speed down. If we get out on the ground and we're looking and we're, uh, we're seeing wheat get blown out the back of the combine, then we go ahead and slow it down a little bit there to uh, get some more grain in the, in the tank. Okay, this here monitor here shows that I've got uh, header control. My, uh, my grain table will move with the contour of the ground. It's got sensors on it. So if you come to a ditch or a low point, it'll keep that head level as you drive through the field and keep it cutting uh, all the beans off or all the wheat off at the same height. This here is the header height. When you're running soybeans, you run this head on the ground. You're trying to cut off about an inch and a half of stubble. Everything else needs to go through the machine to make sure you get all the pods, especially on soybeans that, that like to pod low. So that sensor there helps me keep the header on the ground and get as much grain in the tank as possible. This, uh, this reel is right here on my fingertips. I can move that reel in and out, up and down, depending if the beans are short if they're laid over where my reel needs to be and I can adjust that on the go while I drive down through the field. Again, trying to get as much grain in the tank as possible at the end of the day and not lose anything out the back end. Okay, in the back of the combine there's sieves. I can adjust from right here in the cab. The sieves you can open up, which would be turn the finger, turn basically the fingers up higher. It lets more grain fall through. But if you're getting too much trash into the grain tank, uh, we go ahead and you close those sieves down to go ahead and, and get a cleaner product in the tank. Everything in here that moves basically has a alarm for me. If my feed accelerator, my straw chopper quits working, the chopper is what blows out all the trash at the back of the combine. If it quits working, it will plug the combine up from the front, all, from the back all the way to the front. The discharge feeder, everything and, and anything that's moving, the combine has a sensor and it tells you if it's not working correctly, if, the, if it's slowing down, if it doesn't have enough, uh, enough speed to stay up with the amount of product you're putting through the machine. I started farming with my father back in the, uh, in the late 80s, early 90s. All this that we just went through of being automated and, and just a uh, touch of the button and you can speed up and slow down. A lot of that had to be done from outside the seat or while you were not, uh, you did not have product in the machine. Nowadays, you can adjust this on the fly, which helps us not only to, uh, you're safer because you're doing it from the seat of the combine, but also uh, you're not, you know, shutting the machine off, you get more acres, acres in a day. that video seemed to share a lot better um, but that was him explaining what's kind of going on um, when he's in the combine making sure that he's again getting as much as he can from it and I said that's the last video that I have and we'll throw that in the other one in the chat box I will say these resources um, can be found in various places if you're looking for more ways to build your understanding as a teacher and an instructor, um, trying to kind of familiarize yourself with something you might be teaching your students. That's a great resources, resource and you can find that at um, some more at watchusgrow.org or on the partners website. But it's definitely catered to more of the advanced audience and the older um, generations, but it's there for you to hopefully familiarize yourself so that you can teach your students and um, kind of have maybe a better understanding going into your classroom. With that, um, if there's any questions, I can try to answer them or um, anything else you might have. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. That was so awesome. I love that graphic and those videos. I honestly had no idea that's how a combine worked um, or all of like the advancements and the technology with that is just so cool. Um, so definitely even in, in elementary school, you can start you know, talking to kids about the different uh, farming machinery. Um, you know, what are they used for? What do they do? And then as you get into those um, older grades is show videos like this show the graphics and, and really explain, you know, in, in more depth of how that kind of stuff works. So that's so awesome. Thank you so much. 
Um, before we go, I am going to share, because um, I forgot to earlier, I'm going to share my screen for, um, to show you the, uh, where we can find our Ag Mags in Terra Nova. So if you go to our uh, aginetheclassroom.org website, over here on the left hand side, it says teacher resources, you'll click on that. And then let me move my little screens. Um, we have this, these two right here, Ag Mags and then Ag Mag Reader. So the Ag Mag link, all of these are interactive so that when you click on them, they'll have little leaves or the video cameras that can take you to um, sec primary and secondary sources as more of an in-depth informational, you know, understanding of those different sections. Or if you click on our Ag Readers in Terra Nova, um, this is, we have a, we have um, a few different uh, categories like cooperatives, which is one of our newer ones. Um, so our renewable energy. So when we click on these, we can have the newsletter and um, we're looking at a different format than the um, Ag Max, but it has vocabulary, it has the different types, um, you know, different, all of them have different things. Not all of them have um, a timeline like this one, but they're gonna take you through. So this one is a little bit more higher level than our Ag Mags, but it's super informational just as much. Um, we only have a few minutes left, so um, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to add them into our chat. Um, again, this, um, this recorded session is going to be posted on our beyondthebarndoor.worddesk.com um, blog, um, along with all of our sessions today. And for this specific one, it's going to be the video. Um, it's going to have um, a few different activities that I had mentioned. Um, it's going to have Taylor's videos um, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so please, um, later this afternoon, if there's any of these resources or if you missed something in the session, please feel free to check our blog for that. Um, I'm going to give it about one minute for questions and then we will end. But thank you guys again for joining us in all of our sessions this summer. It's been um, quite the experience um, trying to get used to talking to a virtual audience. But hopefully, like Kevin said, uh, we'll see you in person um, next summer. So um, otherwise, have a great rest of your day. In about 10 minutes, Chris um, Wyan, our uh, education manager from Ag in the Classroom, is going to take us through um, more, another uh, session kind of focused on culture and Hungry Planet, and that's going to start in about 10 minutes. So um, if you don't have any questions, go ahead and log off, take a stretch, get something to drink, and then um, join us again in about 10 minutes. Also, thank you guys so much. It was so awesome to present to you. All right, it doesn't look like we have any other questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the session. Have a great rest of your day and we'll see you in about 10 minutes.